Oh yeah, I knew I was reading something. In 1818, Jean-Baptiste Jules Bernadotte, a once lowly private in the French army, was crowned King of Sweden and Norway under the name Charles XIV. Out of all the kings that were crowned as a result of the Napoleonic Wars, only Bernadotte would survive and maintain his throne. He accomplished this feat by being one of the first to turn his back on Napoleon and instead put Swedish interests first. Even more interesting was the unlikely series of events that led to Bernadotte being chosen to become the ruler of Sweden in the first place. Born on the 26th of January, 1763, son of a prosecutor, Bernadotte would go on to follow in his father's footsteps, securing an apprenticeship to a local attorney for several years. After his father's death, however, he decided on a radical change for his life, and instead enlisted in the Royal Army as a private in 1780, at the age of 17. He would continue to serve in the army, rising through the ranks, until he reached adjunct major in 1790, where he was prevented from advancing any further due to his lack of a noble background. Bernadotte's fortunes would change with the onset of the French Revolution, as he now found himself in an environment where he was able to thrive. Due to his popularity with his men and talent as an officer, he was able to quickly rise through the ranks. During the chaotic fighting of the Revolutionary Wars, he would quickly emerge as a political force thanks to his popularity and actions that established himself as an aggressive commander in battle defending the Revolution. In 1797, he was sent to reinforce Napoleon's campaign in Italy with 20,000 men. There, he would first meet Napoleon and was given a command of the 4th Division. While he would continue to see success on the battlefield, his relationship with Napoleon would turn out to be a complicated one. He did not fully support Napoleon in his political efforts, and found himself in the middle of a political dispute as worries arose back in France that Napoleon might overthrow the government. I wonder why they would ever think such a thing. Attempts to place Bernadotte above Napoleon as chief of the army of Italy ultimately failed to achieve any meaningful change in Napoleon's power, resulting in Bernadotte briefly being relegated to the French embassy in Vienna before ultimately returning to France. From that point on, there would always be a level of tension between Bernadotte and Napoleon. In 1798, he was made commander of a French army on the Rhine and would continue to serve in the army throughout the Revolutionary Wars. Bernadotte would at times find himself at odds with those who supported Napoleon, but when Napoleon conducted his coup of 18th Brumaire in 1799, Bernadotte would choose to neither support or oppose him. His station and popularity gave Bernadotte significant political weight, however, and made Napoleon determine to win his support. Napoleon would go so far as to appoint him head of the army sent to put down the revolt in the Vendée, while he campaigned in Italy, a position of serious trust due to it making him the only commander of a significant military force near Paris in a time when coups on the government were not that unfrequent. With the founding of the French Empire, Bernadotte quickly found himself made one of the original 18 marshals of the empire. He was then given command over the French occupation of Hanover and developed one of the best reputations out of any French marshal for his fairness, ability to govern, and treatment of the people. With the outbreak of war once again in 1805, Bernadotte would once more see repeated success when leading both French and Allied forces against Austria. Prussia's entry into the war would unfortunately see his fortunes take a turn for the worse. During the Battle of Gina Ostat, Bernadotte with his corps failed to reinforce Davout, who was engaged with half the Prussian army at Arstadt and was outnumbered over two to one. 
Though Davu managed to withstand the Prussian assault against his corps, he suffered heavy losses, and Napoleon would hold Bernadotte's failure to reinforce Davu against him. Believing that Davu was left to fend for himself on purpose by Bernadotte, Napoleon seriously considered court-martialing him. However, Napoleon ultimately limited himself to sternly reprimanding Bernadotte for his supposed dishonorable actions, mainly due to the fact that Bernadotte was married to Napoleon's former fiancé, but Napoleon's opinion of his marshal had still soured greatly. The perceived failure of Bernadotte also spawned a bitter rivalry between Davu and his fellow marshal. In defense of Bernadotte, however, his failure to reinforce Davu's embattled corps was not entirely his own fault. The day before the battle, his corps was ordered to cut off the expected Prussian line of retreat along with Davu. On the day of the actual battle, he did not receive new orders from the emperor, and only received a verbal update from Davu that had been sent by Berthier, Napoleon's chief of staff to Davu. It read, If the prince of Ponte Corvo, Bernadotte, is with you, you may both march together, but the emperor hopes that he will be in the position which had been indicated at Dornberg. Bernadotte, receiving this update from Davu, decided to march on his own to Dornberg, rather than wait for Davu's slower corps, prioritizing following his standing orders to cut off the Prussian line of retreat. While on the march, Bernadotte's corps found itself in extremely rough roads that slowed its advance. Even if he had tried to return to aid Davu after fighting began, much of his corps would likely have arrived too late to help. Based on Napoleon's own belief that the main Prussian army would be engaged by his force to the south, Bernadotte was under no compulsion to rush to Davout's aid once battle commenced, as based on Napoleon's own predictions, Davout would be unlikely to need assistance against a much smaller Prussian force. Regardless of why, Bernadotte received the blame for leaving Davout unsupported, and would spend the rest of the campaign in Germany chasing down the remaining Prussian forces in at least some attempt at redemption. It would be here that Bernadotte would first interact with the Swedes. Sweden had been having a rough time since the end of the Russo-Swedish War of 1788 to 1790. They had not suffered any permanent losses of territory against Russia, but the war came at a high financial cost. Combined with other internal issues, Sweden, under its king, Gustav IV, stayed out of any major involvements against revolutionary France, despite Gustav seriously opposing it personally. In 1805, that would change as Sweden joined the Third Coalition against France. For nearly a century, Sweden was the great power of the North. 17th century Sweden was both at its greatest extent and strongest position. Geography and the rising power of the rest of Europe saw Sweden struggle to maintain its position as successive wars began to weaken it as the 18th century progressed. The mentality of the old Sweden was not so easily forgotten, though, and politically, Sweden remained very active in Europe, but without the strength of the past. The Swedish army mainly deployed to Swedish Pomerania during the Third Coalition and had absolutely no meaningful impact on the campaign. During the Fourth Coalition, Sweden forces again made little to no impact on the overall fighting, as the Prussian army was quickly shattered. Out of all of the, albeit very limited, fighting, the most impactful outcome resulting from Swedish efforts was completely unintentional, and actually came from a Swedish defeat. During the war, a large number of Swedes were taken prisoner, as a force of roughly 1,800 tried to make their way back to Sweden, but were caught up in the fighting against the French when Blücher was finally cornered in the city of Lübeck. Their capture had no meaningful impact on the War of the Fourth Coalition, but they bore witness to Bernadotte's desperate, although ultimately unsuccessful, attempts to prevent French soldiers from looting the city. Immediately after the surrender, they also found themselves well treated by Bernadotte and were eventually allowed to return home. Neither Bernadotte or anyone in Sweden at this time knew the impact that Bernadotte's actions would have on the future of Sweden. After the Treaty of Tilsit in 1807, Sweden was isolated on the continent and, in all honesty, probably should have agreed to French demands that Sweden join Napoleon's continental system. Instead, Sweden, under the leadership of King Gustav IV, refused to join the system and attempted to seek aid from the British instead. Even when Russia threatened war in September 1807, unless Sweden joined the continental system, Gustav still refused. Predictably, Russia carried through with its threat to enforce the continental system. And, you know, take Finland for itself, but yeah, it was totally just Russia being a good ally to France. Denmark-Norway followed suit 
and Sweden quickly found itself in a two-front war that it could not hope to win. The war would last one and a half years as Russia methodically advanced into Finland despite desperate Swedish attempts to reinforce and defend its position there. Eventually, all Swedish forces were forced out of the territory, and Russian forces began preparing to invade Sweden itself. Russian forces went so far as to march across the frozen Gulf of Bothnia to advance towards the Swedish capital of Stockholm. With defeat certain and anger over mismanagement of the war running high, a coup was launched against Gustav IV by a group of nobles with support of the army. Gustav was forced to abdicate, and his uncle was quickly proclaimed King Charles XIII of Sweden. Shortly thereafter, Sweden would be forced to give up the entirety of Finland to Russia and finally join the continental system. The war had been a disaster, but another crisis was soon to follow. Charles XIII was 60 years old and in poor health when he was crowned king in 1809. Worse yet, he had no heir to take the throne once he passed. This had actually been one of the reasons he was chosen to replace Gustav, as he was a compromised choice between different political factions. Since he had no heir, the next king of Sweden could be chosen at a later date, when the country was not in the middle of an active war. As soon as the war was over, however, the debates and search for a new heir began. Since any domestic choice was likely to be fiercely fought over and open up old political divides in the country at a time when it could not afford to do so, many supported the search for a foreign king. A foreign heir would also provide the country with a desperately needed strong alliance. Sweden, being so isolated geographically and politically after its defeat against Russia, made it difficult to find suitable candidates. The first choice, a Danish prince named Charles August, was adopted into the royal family, but died soon after arriving in Sweden in 1810 due to falling off his horse while having a stroke. Debates over who should replace him resulted in the Swedish government turning to France and Napoleon. Representatives were sent to the emperor to see if he was open to the idea and to find out who he would prefer. Napoleon liked the idea of his stepson Eugene taking the position, but two issues prevented the possibility. Eugene preferred maintaining his role as the Viceroy of Italy, and refused to convert to Lutheranism, which was a requirement for the Swedes. Before a more suitable candidate could be decided on by either side, a minor noble from Sweden took the matter into his own hands. Baron Karl Mernet, on his own initiative, decided to offer the Swedish crown to a shocked Bernadotte. The Baron made the offer in large part due to his high opinion of Bernadotte's character after his uncle, Count Gustav Mernet, was the commander of Swedish forces captured by Bernadotte at Lübeck. At first, Napoleon was greatly surprised when he learned of the offer from Bernadotte and did not treat it seriously, but he eventually came around to the idea and lent his silent support to Bernadotte. At the same time, back in Sweden, Mernet was arrested for making the offer without approval but by that time, Bernadotte's candidacy was already thrust into the center of the debate. He did have several positive points in his favor that made him an appealing candidate. His military record was generally well regarded, even if not as notable as some other French marshals. He had proven his ability to govern as Minister of War for France and as Governor of Hanover. His connection to Napoleon through his marriage to Napoleon's former fiancée, whose sister was married to Joseph, Napoleon's older brother, also gave him a direct family connection to the emperor. His reputation as a gentleman didn't hurt either, and importantly, he was willing to convert to Lutheranism. Eventually, enough of a consensus was agreed upon, and Mornier's offer to Bernadotte was honored. For his part, Bernadotte committed to his new role with determination, even going so far as to refuse a request from Napoleon that he swear to never take up arms against France, before Napoleon agreed to emancipate him from his duties to France. Upon his arrival in Sweden in 1810, the now crowned Prince Bernadotte quickly found himself in control of the country due to the king's failing health. He would move to make use of his new power to cement his position in Swedish politics and begin rebuilding Sweden's economy that had been decimated by years of war, mismanagement, and poor harvest. As part of his efforts, Bernadotte used a large part of his own personal wealth to pay off the nation's debt. His time as a marshal had given him a significant amount of personal wealth. 
In terms of foreign policy, Bernadotte was determined to maintain Sweden's independence from France and wanted to strengthen the country by acquiring Norway as a replacement for the loss of Finland. Many in Sweden had expected him to try and retake Finland from Russia, leveraging his relationship with Napoleon. Indeed, when Napoleon was planning his invasion of Russia for 1812, he wanted Swedish troops to participate with the promise of regaining its lost territory. Two things stopped Bernadotte from accepting Napoleon's offer. Firstly, he believed that Russia would never view the loss of Finland as a permanent setback, and future wars that Sweden could not afford to fight, or even was likely to win, would result from the reconquest. In his view, Sweden would be better served by unifying the Scandinavian peninsula by taking Norway from Denmark. Secondly, he by this point deeply distrusted Napoleon, and would soon begin actively working against him. Remaining independent of French influence while not antagonizing Napoleon as much as possible was difficult, as Napoleon held power over almost the entire continent. When Napoleon demanded that Sweden join the continental system, Bernadotte was forced to agree, no matter how much it hurt the Swedish economy. With Bernadotte's somewhat poor relations with Napoleon, de Vu, and others back in France, Bernadotte became less and less inclined to work with the French. Tensions came to a head in 1812 as French forces seized Swedish Pomerania. Not trusting a Swedish foothold in his rear as Napoleon invaded Russia, French troops under de Vu seized control of the territory without warning. After receiving the news, and perceiving it as a direct insult from Napoleon, Bernadotte began actively working with both the British and Russians to create a new coalition. Swedish diplomacy would prove critical in mending the relations between Russia and Britain after the previously disastrous coalitions against Napoleon. Bernadotte, for his part, was able to secure a deal with Tsar Alexander that in exchange for not contesting Russian ownership over Finland and aiding Russia against France, Russia would back Bernadotte's move to seize Norway. Britain, too, would back the deal with the three nations forming the Sixth Coalition against France. Bernadotte's diplomacy would not end there, however, as he also helped convince Prussia to join the coalition and recognize Sweden's plan to claim Norway in exchange for Swedish Pomerania. Prussia would join the Sixth Coalition in the spring of 1813. Swedish forces would contribute to the fighting in 1813, and Bernadotte personally would contribute heavily to the Trachtenberg Plan in which the coalition forces would avoid direct conflict with Napoleon and instead focus on his marshals until overwhelming force could be gathered. Bernadotte would be placed in charge of the Army of the North, guarding Berlin, and would defeat both Oudinot in August and Ney in September. His forces would then keep watch on Davout in Hamburg in case he moved south to reinforce Napoleon. No such move ever came, however, and at the Battle of Leipzig, it was forces from Bernadotte that helped break Napoleon's northern front. After the battle, Bernadotte would take his Swedes to launch a quick invasion of Denmark, forcing them to give up Norway in the Treaty of Kiel. Norway would refuse to recognize the treaty, forcing Bernadotte to launch another swift invasion of the territory. Bernadotte was actually somewhat lenient towards Norway, allowing it its own constitution and political autonomy, with it then entering into a personal union with Sweden. Napoleon's defeat in 1814, and then again in 1815 after the Hundred Days Campaign, left Bernadotte as the last remaining Frenchman to keep his throne. His actions against Napoleon early on, and his critical role in the unifying of the Sixth Coalition against Napoleon, meant that the rest of the European monarchies were willing to let him keep his throne. He had more than earned it. 